welcome to So True. And today's devotional is entitled, Out of This World, and it's based on Philippians 3, 20 to 21. Let's take time and read that text. Paul says this, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be transformed uh, to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. In his book, The Parables, Gary Enrig tells this story. It's about Henry David Thoreau, the American writer, who was on his deathbed. And while he was on his deathbed, he was visited by a minister friend who was concerned about his friend's state of soul. Was he ready for death? And so he inquired uh, to David Henry, do you know where you are going in the next life? Thoreau waved him away with the words, one world at a time. One world at a time. What an interesting reply. And yet it's the trademark of the man who lives this life apart from the God who gives life. It's an under-the-sun perspective on life that focuses on self, on time, and on the body over against God, eternity, and the soul. Such was the case with the rich fool in Jesus' parable in Luke 12, 13 to 21. If you read his story, he mistakes his body for his soul. He mistakes time for eternity, and he mistakes himself for God. What we're talking about here with regards to the rich fool, which is the epitome of the man who lives this life apart from the next life, is a godless existence that's all about soil and no sky. Sadly, David Thoreau was speaking for many in this world when he left this world. In fact, according to Jesus, men will live one world at a time until the end of time. I say that because if you go to the teaching of Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 36 to 42, he says that the the days leading up to his return will be like the days of Noah. The last days will be a revisiting of those early days of human history. And sometimes we think that the days of Lot and Noah are days marked by sexual access. But the point Jesus points out that until Noah went into the ark, men seemed to be blind to the flood that was coming, the judgment that was coming. And so they ate and they drank and they went about their business and they got married as if nothing was happening. They lived for this world alone. They lived one world at a time. That's been the case throughout history. And sadly, it will be the case at the end of history. This is how the world rolls. But let's pause. The Christian, by contrast, lives two worlds at a time. The believer in Jesus Christ has an out-of-this-world perspective on life. According to the Apostle Paul, the Christian, as we read in Philippians 3, 20-21, is a citizen of heaven while living on earth. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, he was making a profound statement. And he kind of had a a historical context to that analogy. Philippi was a colony of Rome, which meant that although it was hundreds of miles from Rome, in fact, if my memory serves me right, about 800, their laws and their lifestyle mirrored the imperial city of Rome. When in Philippi, you do what the Romans do. Just as the Roman colonists in Philippi were not allowed to forget their allegiance to Rome, so Paul urged the saints in Philippi not to forget their allegiance to the kingdom of heaven, that this world was not their home. To borrow the words of Hebrews eleven sixteen and carry on this idea of heavenly citizenship, they belong to a better country. The takeaway for those of us who are born from above, who are disciples of Jesus Christ, is that life on earth must be constantly intersected by thoughts of heaven. While our feet are on the ground, our heads are in the clouds, so to speak. Is not Paul's argument in another prison letter, the letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, where he tells us to set our affections and our attention on heaven, 
where Christ is and where we will be with Christ in a future day. Our focus and our identification must be with the laws and the lifestyles of heaven. Heaven must be to us a transforming point of reference, not simply a divine Disneyland in the sky to which we are going someday. In heaven, they are holy, so must we be. In heaven, they are obedient, so must we be. In heaven, they are actively serving the Lord, so must we be. In heaven, they are happy, so must we be. In heaven, they are at peace, so must we be. In heaven, they are united, so must we be. A man was asked to be expected to go to heaven when he died. He replied, why, of course, I live there now. I love that, don't you? Be challenged by that. To be heavenly minded doesn't mean that you are dreamy, impractical, or distant, or detached. It means that you are present in all of life, but you're governed by the future in the moment you're living. As a Christian, have a night of this world perspective on all that you are and all that you do.